Hi guys, it is a gray gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization down here in the, I guess it's the sunshine state of Florida here on this gloomy January 23rd, 2020. And this is Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles. And this week for our podcast, I am very pleased to announce I am finally getting to have a long overdue conversation. We're going to go up, I think we're going up to upstate New York today. No, I'm I'm in California. (laughs) Oh, you're out in California today. You are a globetrotter. Wherever, Wherever this man is, I'm glad I pinned him down. We are getting ready to have a conversation with Dr. Charles A.S. Hall for, I have uh, mentioned Charles in some recent uh, episodes here to whet your appetite for this interview, but for those of you not familiar, Charles A.S. Hall is an American systems ecologist and distinguished professor at State University of New York and the College of Environmental Sciences in forestry. He received his BA in biology from Colgate University, his master's from Penn State, and as he trained as systems ecologist by Howard Odom at the University of North Carolina, where he received his PhD. Since then, he has had a diverse career at Brookhaven Laboratory, the Ecosystem Center at the Marine Biological Laboratory, Woods Hole, Cornell University, University of Montana, and for the last 20 years at the State University of New York College of Environmental Sciences in Forestry. Hall retired from full-time teaching in June 2012, and he now works to consolidate his life work into a format that will continue to be useful for future research. And Charles Hall, come on and say hi and consolidate your life work into a, into a format that will be useful for the listeners of Collapse Chronicles. Uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, hi. And uh, I'm in California for two months in the winter because I retired to Montana. And when you're old, I'm 76, uh, Montana is not a joy in the winter. Um, so, uh, but it's a beautiful sunny day here in California, so there's some hope, Sam, I hope. Okay, well that's why I am in Florida, being a snowbird from, uh, from Ithaca, New York, myself. So, uh, all right, what we were talking about, to, to dive into this subject, just to, to launch into our conversation, uh, somewhere I found this written that, that Charles... Back in 1972, he was the man who explicitly coined the term energy return on energy invested, the famous EROEI or EROI concept. And so we are going to the source. So, Charles, tell us a little bit about what is your definition of EROI is the one I believe you are, that you use, and why is this such an important concept to understand as we're trying to figure out what is going on in the 21st century? Okay, well, first of all, uh, I was trained as an ecologist, a systems ecologist, and that was completely my interest when I was doing my doctoral work from, well, all of my graduate work. Uh, I didn't think about oil wells or anything at that time, or not much, and um, so I I was working with fish migration, and I was interested in how much energy a fish used in migrating from one place to another, uh, and and how much energy it gained from exploiting different ecosystems with different spatial and temporal patterns of uh, what we call productivity or primary productivity, the, the creation of food and the availability of food through food chains. So I, um, I was interested in fish migration or migration generally, such as birds moving north in the summer, 
as a means of investing energy, considerable energy, um, into <clears throat> the pattern of exploiting uh, spatially, temporally varying food chains. Um, and so I, uh, I, it's kind of curious, I actually didn't use the term in my, in my dissertation or in um, the, uh, or in the paper I published in 1972 in the journal Ecology that was uh, related to that. So um, it actually, I don't actually know when I came up exactly with the term. The first time I can find it in a publication of mine is 1977. Now, I use the term net energy, although my thesis dances around energy return on investment. And I should say that the concept in of something very similar, the net energy concept, was available uh, from some economists, uh, some few economists, I might note, uh, especially from the... Um, uh, from the sociologist, uh, um, not Gilbert White, but uh, I'll come up with it. And uh, my advisor, Howard Odom, was very interested in this concept of net energy. Uh, obviously, net energy and EROI are essentially the same thing, but there's a certain cachet to the term EROI that when I started using it, and especially when I published it in a couple of papers that was in Science Magazine, and so pretty pretty well distributed, uh, that it took on a, an important life of its own. But it wasn't until about 1980 that with my students, Cutler Cleveland and Robert Kaufman, they were my students at the time. Uh, they've gone on to have distinguished careers at Boston University, but we we use that term very explicitly in our publications um, later, and we applied that, um, starting with Cutler, we, started, we applied that to looking at how much oil you got out of, uh, how much oil you would return from energy spent in looking for oil. So EROI uh, is defined very simply as the energy returned um, in look in either looking for or more generally in actually obtaining or extracting an energy resource resource compared to the energy that you used for that process. So, for example, if you take a barrel of oil and you use it into uh, and you invest it in seismic exploring and drilling and um, if you find some oil and then in pumping it out of the ground and pressurizing the field and all of those things you have to do to get oil, uh, then you get energy return on investment. And since the energy industry is our nation's largest user of energy, um, then the energy return on energy investment turned out to be pretty important. And what we found in our early publications um, were, was that the energy return on energy invested for oil and gas was uh, very clearly declining over time. And so uh, that kind of caught on uh, and we got a, a certain amount of attention on that in the 1980s. And then the, the price of oil went down and nobody cared about energy anymore. There was a great deal of interest in the 1970s when the price of oil went from $3 a barrel to $35 a barrel and then up to $70 a barrel. But the price came back down during the 1980s, all of which we can explain, um, due to basically what we call physical or biophysical processes. And uh, then people didn't care, and then for a long time, and then the whole field was reignited with a with a paper that was in the Scientific American by by uh, John Larer and, and um, Colin Campbell, um, who were people involved in the oil industry their whole life, and. Uh, they, they published this paper in Scientific American, The End of Cheap Oil, and 
all of a sudden, there was a great deal of interest in this. Uh, a society, uh, the Society for the Study of Peak Oil, uh, peak oil meaning the time of peak production, was uh, going very large. Uh, and I attended a lot of those meetings and sort of reignited my um, interest in uh, well, I always was interested, but I didn't know anybody else was. But uh, I found out there were a lot of people interested. And quite frankly, I don't think I would have had uh, too much attention now if I just stayed as an ecologist. Uh, you know, I've written a couple of, I, I think they're pretty good ecology papers, but I certainly don't have a big reputation in the discipline of ecology, which is moved to someplace completely different from what I understood as a graduate student. And um, so uh, in the last 20 years, I got involved in all of this again and sort of had a secondary career in, in energy of oil wells and so forth. And, uh, well, that's where we are now. I, so I am... I, yeah, go ahead. So, so, so where are we in 2020? I mean, the concern that people who who spend the time researching this subject, I mean, the concern for the balance of this century as we transition out of fossil fuels is replacing them with an energy source with an ER that you an EROI anywhere comparable to that of fossil fuels, and I think a lot of people drift away from the discussion at this point. Their eyes roll back in their head, and they shrug, and this just sounds like some little academic detail, but it's not. It's a, it's a major, why is it so important uh, that any new energy resource uh, somewhat reflects the EROI of fossil fuels. What, is that, what does this mean, a declining EROI to a declining global industrial economy? What connect the dots between, us, between those well, four? Well, first, first of all, um, if you hear somebody say we live in a post-industrial society or we live in an information age, um, that may be partly right, but uh, basically they don't have it. Look, just look around. Everything we have in our lives and in our economies and so forth is about oil. Just, just look out your window. And, uh, and then that's not even counting all the oil that's used to man and energy more generally, of which, you know, roughly uh, two-thirds will be oil and gas, that, that this is... Um, this is what we run on, and we have this sense that we do things with technology or with our creative mind or things like that. We, and, okay, they have something to do with it, but it, fundamentally it all comes down to using fossil fuel to make whatever it, we want, to extract the stuff from the ground, to grind it up, to separate uh, whatever the elements are. So... It, what made us rich was going from a society, um, we know this well for England, from 1300 to 1750, about half of all economic activity was in getting the energy to run the other half of society. Uh, at that time, the energy was the firewood, the, the fodder for animals and, and animal production and so forth, not to mention food. So um, this was, we went to where the cost in our society of, of getting the energy to run that society went down to only 5 or 10%. And that's what we get with fossil fuels. Uh, it's quite curious. Economists downplay the importance of, of um, fuel because they measure everything in, in terms of dollars. But that's the point. That's what they miss. That energy runs our economy, does almost all of the economic work done in our uh, economy, in our society, 
And it does so at a very cheap price because getting fossil fuels out of the ground has been uh, and continues to be to this day uh, really quite cheap. So, um, and what's important is not, well, the reason it's cheap is because you get a lot of energy return on investment. Yeah. You get uh, for globally for oil and gas, you probably get somewhere around 15 calories back or or joules back. I like to use joules. You get 15 joules back for every joule you invest in looking for it. But that's been declining over time. So uh, at one time, we were running on fossil fuels that would return anywhere from 30 to 80 uh, calories per cal or joules <laughs> per joule invested, and uh, for the traditional fuels, it's been declining to somewhere around 15 to 1, and depending where you are, uh, in China, for example, the oil that China produces, they get back only 5 joules for every joule you invest. So obviously, and the higher the EROI, the, the, the more energy, I guess that's a, a surplus. Is this part of what you call the maximum power principle is connected to a higher EROI? And, and as the EROI falls, then there's going to be less energy available to run global industrial society to the level of which we have become accustomed. Is that the bottom line? Uh, I, the short answer is yes. <laughs> so I have it figured yes. out. I, after a year of, uh, of studying this, I'm finally beginning to, to figure out that the big fear of moving to renewables is that they're nowhere close to the EROI of fossil fuels, which means we ain't going to have all of this uh, extra juice to be, be running all our toys uh, as we move through the 21st century. And I think a lot of people are missing this fundamental concept. Well, yes, and, and the answer, the short answer is yes, and there is a longer answer too. Okay. Uh, the problem with the renewable energy, and first of all, is there's a lot of good reasons to move to renewable energy, uh, perhaps most important of which is to protect our climate, if we can do that. Um, but this will not be easy at all for energy as well as other reasons. And so, um, for example, uh, you might get, we did one study in Spain, which is a very sunny country, and I did it with one of the one of Spain's leading solar engineers, Pedro Prieto, so this is available as a book by Prieto and Hall, um, that a small book and an inexpensive book, and we found that you only got back three or four jewels for every jewel invested. And we had we had considered in other publications that society, modern industrial society, probably needs something like uh, I don't know, at least 10 or possibly 15 to 1 to operate in anything like what we're used to, that we're, we have had this huge energy surplus that has allowed us to have all this education and medicine and so forth. To, in, in other words, when my father was a boy, he spent all of his time carrying cow turds from the barn to the field, or a lot of his time. Well, we don't have to use nearly as much of our total uh, work in society to maintain the basic productivity because we make uh, fertilizers using natural gas um, and digging them out of the ground in, in far off uh, Africa and bringing it over by ship and spreading it on all of our fields in the Midwest, etc. So um, we have this enormously energy intensive society that allows us to get things cheaply. Now, now, let me just give you an example. Every dollar you spend uses up about half a good-sized coffee cup's worth of oil or its equivalent as gas or coal or something um, to do the work represented by that dollar. So I look at a dollar bill, and I don't think this is a dollar. I think, well, this is six megajoules. Six megajoules of work 
society will do on my behalf if I give them this, this dollar. And let me give you an example. If you buy a bagel in the Ithaca Bagelry, I used to, um, you get a good bagel there. And what will happen is that somebody will take natural gas in Louisiana and turn it into nitrogen fertilizer using the energy-intensive Haber process and then ship it up the Mississippi on a barge using oil, of course, spread it on a field in Nebraska using a, a tractor, plow up the ground, put in the seeds, put on the fertilizer, cultivate the plants if necessary, and eventually harvest them, all using oil, grind them up, grind up the flour, put them in a sack, and send it to Ithaca, where somebody there will use a... Um, it will use electricity to probably generate it from the from the coal plant over on Cuga Lake and um, use that electricity to mix the batter and then boil the water and heat the oven and cook the bagel, put it in the, ba in the water and then give you a delicious bagel. All of those energy services will be done in anticipation for you paying the dollar of, of buying the bagel, and I, I sure don't want to get into locks because that's a lot more energy. Yeah, but, well, I um, think that dollar bagel is a, is a bargain. It's amazing. Uh, I, I, I used to, I, I sell Christmas trees uh, sometimes, and I did the same thing you just did. You know, people complaining about the price of Christmas trees, and I'm saying it's amazing that this Christmas tree doesn't cost five thousand dollars. <laughs> when, when you go back through the chain of command to the, you know, what went into this Christmas tree, so you can put a dead tree in your living room right. for two weeks and then right. throw it in the landfill. So yeah, I mean, people don't people don't think about this. Now, our I, can I just read something that that one of the I've been combing through all of the stuff that that Charles has sent me. I, can I just read a, a a quote from here and let you do a riff on it? Uh, undertaking this transition to renewables is likely to be far more demanding than anyone perceives amid the biophysical limits. I'm sorry, and the biophysical limits are just the tip of the iceberg for as more energy, can you say money, is needed for these new investments, it will be coming when energy resources are being squeezed in part due to declining EROI and more energy will be demanded to maintain our consumption almost everything labeled quote green has no chance and it needs to be said hence i think the limits to growth remain very real that was a lot in there uh, that was some loaded words Ev almost everything labeled green has no chance and the limits to growth remain very real Take a riff on uh, on on all of that and uh, tell us what you mean by that. Okay, first of all, I, I, as a as an ecologist, a professional ecologist, as in as a human being with a strong environmental concern, um, I would love to have a green future, whatever green means, but. Uh, I'm not opposed to it. I'm just talking about the constraints and difficulties. And more importantly, I'm talking about the amount of science and quantitative analysis that needs to be done by anything labeled green or ideally by our long-term um, commitment, national and, and, industri and uh, corporate commitment to in fact, trying to do something to get us out of the mess that we're in right now, the, the mess meaning the climate and eventually depletion mess that we're in now, the problem with the, the so with, let's say, solar PV and with wind is its intermittency. It's not, the wind is not always blowing. In fact, it blows only about 30% of the time on average. 
Uh, the sun obviously doesn't shine for half the time. Um, getting these intermittent resources lined up for uh, what we want is extremely difficult. It's not difficult with what we're doing now because we're only producing a couple of percent of our energy from these renewable sources. But when you start talking about 20 or 50 or less than 100 percent of our energy from these um, renewable resources, then you're talking about an enormous amount of storage and or what we call overbuilding. You have to build, uh, for example, the, the wind is always blowing someplace in Ireland. So somebody had a proposal, well, we could provide all the energy you need in Ireland um, from three wind farms at the north, the east, and the west. The trouble is you, the wind only blows a third of the time at each place and you'd have to connect them with wires. The, you'd have to overbuild your production facilities by at least a factor of three, plus you'd have to have an enormous investment in wires to connect them all in other electrical infrastructure. Now, it's not impossible, but it has to be examined very carefully as to what the cost of these are. Uh, lots of buildings that are labeled as green are not any greener than, um, than their equivalent per square foot. The guy at Oberlin's done some good analysis on this. And lots of things that are labeled green are socially virtuous, and I'm all for that. Um, but nobody's done the energy cost of whatever they're talking about. I find almost no good energy analyses out there except amongst a, a very small handful, a few dozen people around the world who, who do good analysis. For example, recently, uh, somebody who's really caught my attention is a guy called Indio Capelez Perez. Huh. Uh, and he, he, Capelan uh, Perez. And you can Google him, Ingio I N G I O uh, or E I N G I O or something like that. Kaplan uh, Perez, and he has done a really good in analysis indicating that if we went to a transition to a hundred percent electricity, the energy return on investment would go down to something like two to one. I can't find anything wrong with his analysis, but obviously we all. We have to look at all the analyses very carefully. You mean through renewable? Um, You're talking about if, if we went 100% renewable, the EROI would, would plummet to two to, two to one. Two and to you one can't and run a modern civilization yeah, on yeah. anything like that. It's, it's just crazy. So, so um, you can kiss goodbye to what our idea of global industrial civilization with, with yeah. numbers like that. Well, and I'm not a person who uses collapse, but I am a person who says, well, I think that it, we talk about how cheap energy is now and how that allows a great deal of economic surplus. I think there will be very, very serious constraints unless somehow we handle this transition much better than anything I've seen. But you're not you're not quite ready to use the c word uh, now. I notice you do you do quote uh, you you do freely quote Joseph Tainter and uh, Paul Ehrlich and uh, yeah, yeah. they and, use and the, the c lim word <laughs> and the limits to growth. Uh, I mean, in your in your own writings, you certainly uh, sound like you do not disagree with a lot of. I, of, I do of not. What they say I, I do not. I do not do policy. By the way, I just do science. So uh, I don't have a policy position, so, but I do try to understand things. And I think the most um, insightful analyst on this is a guy named Nafiz Ahmed. Wow. And he wrote a uh, wonderful book called, uh, let's see, Collapsing Societies and uh, something else, and The Biophysical Triggers of Social Violence. And so what I do see that I attribute to these things, he lays out very nicely 
um, in terms of energy return on investment, which in basically simply the Hubbard curve, meaning up and down of oil production for various countries. Let's just take Egypt. Let's take Syria. We can take Nigeria, uh, Venezuela. When, when a country discovers oil and there might be two or four decades of growth in oil production, the government can sell the oil abroad and that allows it to pay for pensions and do many things that are socially popular, like subsidize the price of gasoline, uh, like France did using Algerian oil, et cetera. Um, but, but when it's gone, you pull the rug out from people. Yeah, uh, All of these riots that we've been hearing around the world, almost all of them are initiated by the government trying to remove the subsidy of oil or bus transportation or whatever, some energy related subsidy. And once people get used to them, when you stop them, they go bananas. And again, we've, we've seen it in all around the world, Ecuador, Argentina, okay. Colombia, Venezuela, uh, I suspect it's going to be coming up in UK, where the North Sea oil has basically been used up and depleted. Uh, in Netherlands, it's just closed its great Gotha Hinton, uh, Hoveningen, however the Dutch say it, um, uh, gas field because it was causing earthquakes <laughs> and so forth. So uh, these are. These are areas where, which have severe economic problems because people get used to, for example, having diesel power to pump water out of the Suez Canal up to the uh, wheat and rice fields of Egypt. And all of a sudden that oil is not available or not at a price that the farmers can afford. And uh, then that turns to people being hungry and that turns to riots and so forth and so on. So all of this has been laid out very nicely by Nafiz Ahmed. And my guess is that there will not be some kind of, I mean, who knows, but some kind of global collapse, but that there are serious, serious economic repercussions of peak oil that are occurring country by country. You got to remember that somewhere between uh, 32 and 38 out of 46 oil producing countries have reached peak oil and are on the decline. Just absolutely perfect uh, Hubbard curves. And you can look at papers by John Halleck and myself on these, and it shows it very clearly. And six of eight continents have had peak oil. So the, the thing that a lot of people don't understand is that this limits to growth stuff isn't playing out for the world as a whole. It's playing out region by region. And, and in the United States, we're protected because we've had this fracking revolution. So gasoline is cheap. People are not rioting in the streets much. And uh, here we go. Uh, now, we're having... Climate, uh, a lot of people that are uh, having going to the streets because of climate, and that's good, and they should, but it won't be anything like what will happen if, uh, or I will say when, this uh, shale production begins to have serious decline. When do you predict that will be? Um, I, um, could that's be... Good. That's could be answer. next year. What's could that? be next year, likely within one and possibly two decades. David Hughes from Canada has done really good analysis of this. Uh, I mean, the people that are listening to your broadcast should realize that, well, you know, we scientists are kind of, uh, might be kind of boring and dull. Uh, there, there is beautiful work done to support everything that I say. And anybody's welcome to email me, chall at esf.edu, and say, how can you say that? What is your reason for saying whatever you're unhappy about or happy with or whatever? And I will send them the references because uh, what we learn in science is to 
do science in a way that's repeatable and to respect what was done by our our peers formerly unless and this is what's good about science and in, in, unless somebody comes along and tests it and finds it not to be the case and if that were the case then i would not quote it and i try to put in uh, varying opinions because we have that too but a lot of the science you're quoting uh now you you denied vehemently before we started this uh, Charles told me he is neither a collapsitarian nor an apocalyptimist. He is a scientist. <laughs> but a lot of the science you're quoting is is sounds to me like uh, if, if it talks like a duck and walks like a collapsitarian, you know what I'm saying. I, I I'm hearing a lot of the same thing that some of these quote doomers are saying, but you're just a little more measured in your language, so you're not quite ready to step down here into the doomosphere, uh, although you're certainly tiptoeing around the edge of the abyss, or am I being, am I reading too much into your comments? I don't see any reason we can't adjust to what I consider to be inevitable um, constraints on our economic system if we focus on uh, ending population and um, ec especially economic growth. Uh, okay, if, if, we, you, have, you have mentioned, you went there, you just slaughtered the sacred cow with that, brother. So I'm going to read one more quote from this man, then he's going to... He's gonna and I want to say, wait, Sam, okay. I want to say one more thing. All right. We went through all of this in 1970s, when I was just out of graduate school, with the limits to growth and so forth. And, and, and here, here we are 50, 50 years later. Yeah, and here we are 50 years later, and I got a uh, car in the driveway. It's got gasoline in the tank. I've got heat if I want it, and I've got lots of food on the table. And um, so... All right, let me read I didn't this predict quote. One collapse one. then. I don't predict it now. Human society it does have a large capacity for um, adjustment. And I think that, quite frankly, so the question is whether the adjustment is technological. Oh, boy, we're going to find a new source of oil uh, that has uh, goods and bads. Uh, and I don't know what it would be. Of course, I didn't know what fracking would be in the year 2000. Yeah. So uh, there's always that possibility. Uh, I don't, I don't see it, but it's always that possibility. And the second is that if we make very serious, I, I mean, we could get rid of airplane travel. Oh yeah. We could get rid of <laughs> uh, bringing in all this consumer stuff from China. What we, we could, could do and what we will do are are two separate things. Very let, let me well let me read this quote and then uh, and, and and then you can you you can take a, a run a, a run with this because one thing you don't have Charles and good and good for you brothers you don't have any ch uh, children or grandchildren's mouths to feed I notice okay here's at some point in all of this emailing back and forth between the two of us I find this. There is no possibility, logically, for resolving these issues without stabilizing or reducing populations and economics, I'm sorry, and economies, issues not even considered by most. If we do not do that through effective policy, then nature will do it for us. But what the hell? I do not do policy. I understood all this when I was 22 and did not have kids. So what the hell? But I do not wish to inflict or see pain on any humans. And I think pain would be less if we collectively understood all of this. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to applaud you there, uh, Charles A.S. Hall, for one of my favorite quotes I have ever come. Uh, and, and you're saying this is not from a collapsitarian, that quote. Uh-oh, are you there? 
that I, oh, yeah, that oh, I yeah. render you speechless oh, with I'm, your own words. I, ta- Sam, can I put in a plug <laughs> okay. for... Uh, are we done, Sam? No, we're not done. Uh, oh. oh, okay. We, good. We got good. about fifteen. Oh. We got about fifteen minutes. So uh, okay, let's let's get into biophysical economics. Well, talk before you do. Yep. Take a riff on there is no possibility for resolving these issues without stabilizing or reducing populations and economies. So you, you're not you're willing to make that statement, but you're not willing to tread into the policies of how we do that. Yes, that's correct. You're gonna you're gonna put you're gonna dangle that out there, and I agree with it. But you're not you're, you're you are not one to make policy recommendations. You are just one to to give the science and let the policy makers do with the science what they want. Is that a safe way of? Uh, I, yes, I would like po- policy makers to be uh, advised by good science. Uh, it's looking more difficult these days, but uh, that's the idea. And uh, But the science, I, I'm more interested in cleaning up the house of science, who I think does not do net energy analysis for everything they're talking about and don't even know how to do it, and do not know how to look at, as you say, uh, I think you use the term uh, chain of command, but it's a chain of production for everything that we're talking about. We yeah. have to understand that. If you're talking about a wind turbine, then you've got to talk about all the stuff you have to build to make a wind turbine and to maintain it, to use it, to recycle it, to whatever, and especially to be able to use the intermittent energy from it. Yes, we, we need to do that much more carefully than we have. Okay, That's, so, a, that's avoiding your issue. No, no I, I won't well, do well, policy. Go ahead we, and, we have elected officials to do policy. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't, don't get me going down that rabbit at all. Charles, all right, so talk to the scientists. Let's talk about biophysical uh, economics and, and try to uh, uh, try to convince the neoliberal economists to uh, put the planet before profits. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, I'm not one who who uh, castigates the concept of profits. I mean, obviously. Reasonable profits are part of anything getting done, um, and people people castigate the oil companies for making big profits. They don't. It's the drug companies and the and the soft drink companies that make really, as a percentage, huge profits. But uh, let's not go there. We want. If you don't use oil, then you can castigate the oil companies, and that's got to be including indirect uses too. But we all use it. We're all part of the system. Uh, but one of the problems, the biggest, one of the biggest problems I see is um, how we do economics. And I, when I was a young professor, um, I got really upset with my own discipline, ecology, because I thought an awful lot of what was done in ecology was increasingly was bullshit. And so... Uh, that's a long story, but I decided I took off about six years and and studied economics um, because I thought that economics was a better developed science. They got Nobel prizes and had a lot of smart people or something like that. And I, I and I was especially interested in models in ecology computer models and then mathematical models in ecology. And um, mo- and then I went in and looked at models in, in economics, and I was astonished to find that the models in economics were on an even weaker foundation, much weaker foundation than they were in ecology. That, that they, I, I wrote about this in a paper in uh, 2001 in bio, 2000 in, in bioscience in called the need to reintegrate the natural sciences with economics. And from that and from some earlier work, too, we have developed an approach to economics that is not based on uh, 
social sciences, but is based on natural sciences, and it's called biophysical economics. The actual models used by economists, um, they, they are not consistent with the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, they, are, they are not consistent with the law of conservation of materials. They have other ways that they are not consistent with the, what we call the biophysical world, uh, the world of natural sciences that you learn in, in chemistry and physics and, and bio, in your, your other courses in college. And so we set out to build uh, a, uh, a society, a textbook, a, an approach, a conceptual approach that's called biophysical economics. And uh, we have meetings more or less yearly. We're going to have one this June in Montana and um, where I live, incidentally, and um, we're going to have, uh, uh, there's quite a lot of activity I'd like to promote to you, to your readers, uh, my textbook, Energy and the Wealth of Nations, uh, a biophysical, uh, or uh, um, an introduction to biophysical economics. So it's a, it's a textbook or a reading book that, that lays it all out. There it is. And a shorter version is called Energy Return on Investment, strangely enough. Uh, these are both available from Springer. Um, so I would really think the important thing is, is to stop teaching our children fairy tales in economics co courses in college and teach them the reality. Let me just give you an example, as I did with the bagel. If, what, what does economics mean to most people? Well, it means a roof over their head, food on the table, a car in uh, the garage, perhaps, or access to transportation and many other things. Um, none of these are available without energy. And as I said, at roughly six megajoules a dollar. So, or half a coffee cup of oil per dollar is required for everything that you do. And, and this has to be the starting place for thinking about what economics is all about. And so um, there's, you know, there is much from conventional economics that's useful, but as a foundation, the first chapter in almost any economics textbook is a lie. It shows that the economy is simply a, a, a circular diagram between firms and households. That's just absolute horseshit. And so we have another simple diagram that shows what economies really are. And we have to start thinking about our economics by including nature as the source of all of our goods and services. And that energy is required to upgrade the raw materials from nature into everything we, we every item, every good, we buy and every service that is obtained. So uh, anyway, it's all laid out in these books and um, I sure wish they were used by the, for the first economic course and then let them teach any other economics they will and let the students say bullshit or not as they wish. So how much penetration do you have into the economics curricula of major American universities with your beat with biophysical economics? Virtually none. Almost none. Why do you why do you think that is? That people just they, they, they just don't want to admit the inconvenient truth of what you're trying to say? Well, I, I've, I've never uh, I've given talks at many economics departments. I've never had anybody say that I wasn't right. Uh, never had an economist tell me that I wasn't right. Um, and I have you know hundreds or thousands of students who have taken my courses and. Not a one of them hasn't basically signed up when they're done to our approach. Uh, but you but you they know, moved if there? what we say is correct, then their whole life of training, and it's very difficult and complex and mathematically complex training of economists, is for nothing. And so they have to admit that everything that they learned in their life is, it, it, it's not useless, but it has to be rethought in terms of this biophysical perspective. 
And you don't get tenure for doing that. I guarantee you that. I can give you some <laughs> examples I bet. of people who signed up to this and then didn't get tenure or were severely uh, challenged in, in their young, when they're a young economist. It, the word for the field of economics is hermetic. They're all sealed in their own little glass container, and uh, they, they do not, they're not interested in anything beyond this artificial world of prices and, and um, that, that satisfying human wants and desires is the end all and be all in only approach to economists. And I'd like to point out that our, our book, Energy and the Wealth of Nations, was written by myself and a really good economist, Ken Klitgaard, who's an economic historian and can tell you that economics in its long history was often about the natural world, about natural resources, even about energy. But that all got submerged in what was called the marginal revolution and that's a long discussion but so what's uh, what's it going to take to turn the train around i mean uh we, we, no, we got to get any... your this this interview out to uh 100,000 economists there you go good, good. i i i would like to think that 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 one neoliberal economist <laughs> is going to switch on to a youtube channel called collapse chronicles but it could yeah. it, it, it it, it could happen. I mean, obviously, I well, if any of you take the limits to growth to uh, yeah. we're, we're going to have to hit the wall before. If any of start. your listeners know any economists and know them well, then get them to listen to this. Incidentally, do you know that the the predictions of the limits to growth? Made in 1972, or still basically on course? I know that very well. Uh... And I and, and I'm surprised if, if you agree with that that you're not quite ready to pitch yourself in the collapsitarian side of the equation. But, uh, but for, well, for for the record, you're not. The on record, a, I'm not. All right, on the uh, on a personal note, before we start to uh, to start to wind this down. Uh, do you consider your decision, it looks like at age 22, which was the same year I made the same decision, to not have kids? Uh, are, you, uh, are you happy you made that decision looking back to, to yourself as a younger man? And would you recommend to other 22-year-olds who have not had children to stick with? Uh, would, do you recommend that course? not having kids. Uh, remember, I, I don't give policy, so you, you, you make up your own mind. I can tell you only what I think. I'm very happy not to have kids, especially, you know, I look around me. Uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, the, the heartbreak that, that yeah. about my guess is one in four children bring to their parents. Um, so... Um, and I know that children bring great joy. And if I had children, I'd probably love them to death, whatever they did. Um, and um, maybe, you know, since children often rebel against their parents, then they become, they go and become neoclassical economists. I don't know. But um, uh, what would I, uh, I, I don't miss them. I can promise you that. I don't miss them. I am glad I did personally did not have children. Uh, I had other things I wanted to do in my life. I wanted to become an ecologist, and that was very, very hard, a uh, Ph.D. ecologist. I wanted to see the world, and I did. I worked in, I worked in 30 different countries. I wanted to spend a lot of time fly fishing, and I did that. And uh, I've, I've had a wonderful life. And I've you have a dog. I, I, we, all, we, we all know you have a dog. Uh, so anyway, well, uh, Charles uh, Hall, I, I, we, we could go on uh, with, with this discussion and we could take it in 500 other directions, but we are a few minutes from the collapse of global industrial civilization here on my, here on my microphone. So uh, as I do 
with all of my guests uh, to wrap up this conversation of, of the, what I would call conversation of the collapse. Uh, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles and had a full hour to uh, expound upon your ideas, but had the mainstream media with a microphone in your face and you had 60 seconds to send out the Charles Hall message to the world in the opening bell of the 2020s, what would that 60-second soundbite sound like to wrap this up? I was trained as an ecologist. Ecologists think a lot about the limits to growth in natural communities. I've also thought a lot about the limits to growth in human societies. The original limits to growth models, which were often castigated as not working, are, in fact, in the analysis of, of uh, Graham Turner, um, right on track as of 2014 at least, uh, and quite possible. I am also concerned that my specialty, which might be considered peak oil, peak oil is not has not gone away. It's reality for three quarters at least of oil producing countries very, very clearly, there are three quarters of oil producing countries are on the downslope, and for six of eight continents. This will put serious constraints on what we can do economically in the future. The best way we can prepare for this, in my mind, would be to think about reducing growth of populations and growth of economies, reduce our impact on the planet. There are many good reasons for this, um, and, but the, any, um, anything that we might do along this path has to be thought about very clearly in terms of energy costs and gains, because many things that are sold as being green are not green at all. Given uh, that, we should do the best we can. Okay, and that is great advice, and stick around a minute after we after we uh, say goodbye here. Uh, and guys, for if you enjoyed this interview with Charles, please take a few seconds to thumb up what Charles had to say. If you did not appreciate what Charles Hall had to tell you, you can thumb it down and by all means come over here and subscribe to Collapse Chronicles. But right now, this is Sam Mitchell saying, as much as I hate to say this, we have got to wrap this up. And Charles Hall, we really appreciate you coming here and spending an hour out of uh, your, your day to talk with us, and more importantly, we really appreciate your lifetime of hard work, and keep up the good fight. <laughs> you can say bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. <laughs>